Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. No one wrote about this city with greater passion than Pete Hamill. It is palpable in his novels, his memoirs, his essays, and of course his trenchant newspaper columns. Pete Hamill died last week at 85. In my last conversation with him four years ago, Pete told me his first interest was not in journalism, but in the visual arts. Well, mostly it came from comics, you know. Uh, I have here in the apartment a lot of original cartoons and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to remind me where I came from. <laughs> uh, well, you, you wanted to be a comic book artist, yeah. as I understand. Yeah. And I went to the School of Visual Arts uh, and to Pratt Institute. Uh, and when I went to Mexico, which I did first, um, I went to study painting, mm. get the major in painting on the GI Bill. In uh, Mexico? In Mexico in 1956. Why and Mexico? It, uh, I wanted to go to Paris because I loved the story of Babar, you know, where this poor elephant's mother gets shot and he wanders off and ends up in Paris. Uh, but I couldn't afford it. Uh, you know, once I started figuring out how much I would get on the GI Bill, there was no way I could be in Paris. But Mexico, I, I could afford. And I had some really good teachers of painting there. Um, but I got more and more interested in writing because of the, what, what had imprinted itself in my skull uh, was the narrative comic strips. Mm -hmm. A panel said, this happens, and this happens, and as a result, this happens. Something big. Uh, so I, I couldn't figure out how to, in a painting, make that happen. I, uh, years later, I thought, gee, maybe I should have done panels while I was painting or something. You know, who knows? Yeah, did you ever did you ever create a cartoon or or uh, do much painting? I di I did, but I, I I didn't. I published some. I published a car a comic uh, a cartoon in Ace Comics. Uh, I, I I published a few, but not comic strips. Mm -hmm. You know, just cartoons. But by the time. Um, I began to pick up greater skill with the drawing. I was less interested. I was more interested in the story, in the tale, in the people. And I was lucky because I had that. You know, I, in other words, I, I didn't walk around after I dropped out of high school and so, say, schmucko, you ruined your life, you know. <laughs> Uh, there was another thing around the corner, you know, that I could do. Yeah. Uh, and it gave me, a, you know, an impetus, impetus to keep um, learning more. You know, I wanted to, I, I felt like the fact that I had dropped out of high school meant that I was playing a form of catch-up ball. And so I became an even more intense reader, mm -hmm. uh, more of, uh, absorbed with trying to find out who was good and why. Um, and uh, the library in Brooklyn uh, helped defeat it. It was the treasure house of all the great stuff in history. And uh, so even though I didn't become what I thought I was going to become, I became something. A writer. And, yeah, and, and the thing was, what I came to understand, and I was never competitive with any of my contemporaries. I never, 
I never said I want to be better than this guy or that guy or that guy. It was I wanted to be the best version of me I could make. That uh, I wouldn't satisfy myself with the cheap shot, with the, you know, remarks instead of literature. You know, uh, that I wanted it to be uh, as genuine as I could be and have a good time too. I thought that in life you could you could love Gustav Mahler and Dean Martin in the same li lifetime. You could you you could admire certain low life comi comics and Voltaire. It was doable. They were all there, and they were free. In yeah. the library. In the library. So uh, I was lucky that way. I, I had a library card before I could read. My mother insisted. <laughs> you know, she she was the cashier in an RKO movie house, and uh, in Park Slope. And uh, all of us could get in free. You know, we just went over and we yeah. waved, and they. She wouldn't let us unless we got library cards uh -huh. and used it. The quid pro quo. Yeah, and use it. If you're gonna read and if you're gonna go to the movies for free, you gotta read. Yeah. You know. And I think that was typical of so many immigrants of all backgrounds. Well your interest in writing growing from the reading finally found a, a place, a, a first job of writing at the post. Uh, you were 25 years old. Much different paper, The Post, when you yeah. joined it than it is today. Yeah, it was Dorothy Schiff owned it, and it was then uh, the most liberal of the papers when there were seven papers at the time, dailies. And uh, there was a staff of guys that really wanted to take a dumb kid like me and help train me. You know, they really believed in the old uh, development of craft, you know? You can't do that. You can't use that many adjectives in the lead or else blah, 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 you know? It would, and and it, they did that for me and for Nora Ephron and for all kinds of people. The g most brilliant writers, Murray Kempton and people like that, uh, th thought nothing of stepping o over on the side and saying, that piece you had today, you know, would have been better if you moved this paragraph over there. You know, you, you ended up with a kind of generosity uh, and a spirit that wanted to make the thing better and therefore make you better uh, by, by encouraging you, by showing you what a mistake you make doing it this way. And once you heard that, you didn't get upset. You said, I'll never do that again. You know, the craftsman had a way of doing it that doesn't, didn't sound like punishment. Uh, that said, look, the way we do it is X, Y, or Z. Yeah. And, you know, the journalist Pete Hamill learned quite well from those good teachers and went on to yeah. other newspapers and many, several other newspapers, magazines, so much writing, books. Um, I, but it's, I, uh, you know what it's like, Tony. You, you, whatever success you have, you're rode in on the shoulders of giants. You know, some of those giants were five foot two. Yeah. And it didn't matter. You know, the, both the ones that raised us and the people that we met along the way. I still carry the lessons of the, the giant who was five foot two. Four, I think, in my case, who, yeah. who taught me essentially how to do this. 
Yeah. And um, that's more than 50 years ago. And, and lessons about how to be a man. You know, it wasn't simply about the craft. Uh, uh, that was part of it. I remember Paul Sand, my editor, one point I was at the paper about two years then. And I'm typing one day and I'm typing. <laughs> he walked over and he said, if you should die before you finish writing that, make sure there's nothing in it that you're thoroughly ashamed of. And <laughs> kept walking. <laughs> but that's what they were like. Sure. You know? What a lesson. What a you know. I want to talk about a recent piece, very recent piece in National Geographic about this city. I mean, there's many people talk of you, Pete, as, as the poet of New York City, the bard of this city. No one sings the song of New York better than Pete Hamill. And so here in the National Geographic, you're reflecting on the city. And I was, I was a bit taken aback. You said, my beloved New York is in a bad way. How do you mean that? I mean that certain things, as epitomized by the super tall buildings that are going up everywhere, erasing the sky and, and throwing shadows into our lives, um, are more a triumph of money than of architecture. They're more uh, building refuges uh, for people who don't want to live here. I don't get a sense walking past some of those buildings. There's a few right here in Tribeca where I live um, that there are people living in these buildings who are not going to join the Parent Teachers Association, uh, who are not um, uh, particularly interested in finding out the name of the guy that sells the newspaper or the butcher's last name uh, or the kind of things that came from neighborhoods. Yeah. Because the neighborhood was the kind of series of connected hamlets that made New York so rich, particularly if you were a reporter. You know, you could go from one block to another and it was a different world. Um, and I, the, the last two or three years with the explosion of these buildings, uh, the super talls, they, I, I just felt that they were losing a sense of themselves as people in control of their lives in, the, in this city, that it was being determined by some other standard, but not the standard that had shaped me and a whole lot of other people who grew up here. Your point about it's, it's money and it's not community. Yeah, that's exactly the point, yeah. Are, are, do you see other things that have, that have that please you about the city as you reflect on it? Oh, I think, I think in so certain ways, in spite of some of the hysteria in the newspapers, I think race is better than it was 50 years ago when I was a kid. I think some things are worse. There's too many guns in a city like this, but there's too many guns everywhere in the country. I, I think certain things work better. The subways work better. Uh, getting to and from places is easier to do, unless you're in a taxi trying to get to 57th <laughs> Street from Tribeca. Then you got an hour of your life you never get back. I, I think there's uh, the education system's better from what I know about it. I think manners are better. After September 11, people were politer. 
excuse me, they would say on the subway, and you would be in shock for two days. <laughs> um, but it's a, you know, the, and I, I accept the fact that a, a city, any city, but particularly this city, is, is dynamic, which means that it's changing all the time. I just don't like the way it's changing. Uh, with the architecture, particularly, I think there's a kind of effrontery involved in in the in the new architecture that it's uh, sneering at the midgets down at the bottom of the world and flexing muscles at the top mm. somehow and I might be imagining most of that, but I can't help it. I look at the building like this, and um, I remember it, growing up hearing the advice to young people, never live higher than a fireman's ladder. Mm. You know? and. There were a lot of firemen in our neighborhood. <laughs> Park Slope. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about manners, and um, unfortunately, I think, on display for the country right now is an epitome of really bad New York manners by the name of Trump. <laughs> oh. I thought at the beginning it was the whole Trump thing would be a relief, a kind of laughter, prolonged laughter. But the it's turned into an ugliness to me. The ad hominem attacks, you know, that you got to attack Clinton herself and then you attack her for not smashing Bill Clinton for his infidelities or what, you know, whatever it is. Full of judgment and scorn and sneering. I don't like that. That's, and racism. I mean, Muslims keep that. Yeah, out. yeah, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, his, uh, I, I, I've seen that the, the uh, slogan of his, uh, his presidential race is, is make America great again, and yet the words that come out of his mouth about one race, another race, another race, immigrants well, all, it's almost like the slogan should be make America un-American. <laughs> yeah. Or let's, ha let, let's go back to what it was that we mentioned when we say the word again. Uh, do you want to bring back slavery? How about that? Do you want to do you want to sell more heroin than we did in the 1950s? Yeah, that'll make America great again. When has it been great that you've been in the army or something to help make it great? This guy's got five deferments. Yeah. You know. Gail Not Collins. as many as Dick Cheney, but he didn't go out there with a rifle to go be a tough guy, you know? Gail Collins, with her typical sly wit, told me, uh, you know, what she laments is that the rest of the nation is seeing the first New Yorker, New York City person who's ever run for president. They're saying this is, this, and, they're, and they're making judgments about this is what New Yorkers are like with, you know, by watching this guy. I, I hope she's... Wrong about that. I hope she's wrong, too. I hope they just think of it as part of the freak show, the American freak show, and get past it. But who knows? The, the, a lot of these guys have been raised in a cult, a political culture that's either corrupt or arrogant uh, that doesn't seem to be about trying to help anybody. The thing that made the Democrats machines in the old days, the Tammany machines, is they were 
uh, it was service oriented politics. Mm. You needed a lawyer for your dopey son, we'll get you a lawyer. You need a bail bondsman, we'll get you a bail bondsman. But all you have to do is vote for us for the rest of your life, uh, which people did gladly to be able to get help at certain crucial times. Now, people don't know where the hell the de democratic office is. It's in some uh, area called 800 thing. Uh, it's not around the corner somewhere. Mm. You know, uh, when I, I, I don't want to be a nostalgia freak, but when my father lost his leg playing soccer, he got his leg kicked and smashed in the 1920s. And by the next morning, they amputated. Because hmm. um, there was no penicillin then. There were no antibiotics of any kind. Uh, he got his first job as a clerk because he had good handwriting. He only went to the eighth grade, but he got a job as a clerk because he could no longer do the Irish specialties of the, of the era. He couldn't work on the docks. He couldn't be an iron worker. He couldn't do those jobs, but he got a job and was able to raise a family on the basis of that job. And that plus his union allowed him to have a life, you know, that was, Dignity is probably the wrong word, but this did not involve begging. Mm. And he's not the only one. There were, there were thousands and thousands of people in this city and in other cities like Chicago and Philadelphia who had organized politics that gave people better lives. Um, now, Politics is a television show. You know, I look at the 17 narcissists running for president and think, did they ever help anybody do anything? Did they help an old lady cross a street without a camera in the, around somewhere? Um, I don't think so. So much of your life spent in newspapers and you edited two of them here in here in this city um i don't know if i should even ask you but do you have any faith that we're gonna that the kind of newspaper that you grew up on and worked on is going to survive the short answer is no too many of the papers have gone fleet street which means they drive all the women readers out. The women readers are the people that buy toasters at Macy's. Um, and if you drive them out of your readership, you're making a terrible mistake. But, you know, they think the, the world is about T and A on page three. Mm. And if they continue to do that, it's oblivion. Uh, it'll be a memory, there'll be people assembling in universities to go watch front page or something on an old television set. His Girl Friday. Yeah. Uh, and I, I feel terrible about that because it, it's, I've had my life. I've had a wonderful life. Um, with disappointments and, and small defeats. But the newspapers uh, gave me a chance to have a life uh, instead of an apology. The life allowed me to do something that helped other people, that helped my friends, that helped me 
live in the best sense uh, a rich life where I could worry about murders in Brooklyn and read Balzac too. <laughs> you, know? you have enriched all of our lives, Pete Hamill, with, Thank you. with the newspaper work, with the magazine work, with the books, nonfiction, and the novels. You made our lives better, at least those of us who have read you, and certainly uh, it's an honor to know you, and, and I thank you. Thank, thank you, man. That conversation is just the warm-up. Pete and I also chatted about his long friendship with Frank Sinatra, inspiration for Pete's book, Why Sinatra Matters. I hope you'll join me for that conversation next week.